So assume someone reads your books, listens to your lectures, and says, I'm in. I'm 100% plant-based, whole food, doing exactly what you say. So now that you've seen these people for the last 40 years, will this completely prevent heart attacks, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's? Does it reduce it by 5%, 10%? Like, you know, if someone says, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take a lot of time and effort, it's going to change my life, what's the payoff? Are you saying that we're going to reduce, like I feel like I don't smoke cigarettes and I feel a, on my chances of lung cancer are way less. So how much less for the person in this room that says, I'm in, I'm doing it 100% like you say, how much less is their chance of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, kidney disease, and throw in 10 more diseases? Every disease you mentioned is a minimum double digits, double digits. But why everyone that comes to us gets psychotherapy, that's a major factor. If you don't change your attitude about your life, first it's hard to maintain a healthy lifestyle, and that's a factor we have to see. So to preclude other factors, your environment, you have a great marriage, you like your job, would be sort of silly. But at the same point, I don't know one study that's ever been serious that looked at diet, vegan diets and catastrophic disease that didn't show remarkable differences. Prolonged life. Look at the studies that were done out in Loma Linda. What was the, what was the 12-year difference in lifespan just by uh, not even a great vegan diet? You know, make-believe meat diet they were looking at. And so, overwhelming data shows us that. We don't have to look very far to see that. I agree. I go to Loma Linda and I see it. It's amazing how poor the diet is of the Seventh-day Adventists <laughs> who get 12 years of extra lifespan because they're eating a junk food vegan diet, mostly with a lot of fake meats and a lot of, you know, I'm looking at what they're eating. I'm saying this isn't anywhere near a healthy diet and they're still getting these benefits. Exactly. So I'm agreeing 100%. But of course, um, the, the direct answer to your question is, what's the decreased risk of lung cancer you get comparing a non-smoker to a smoker. Right. What's the decreased risk? Are you half the risk of lung cancer? Are you one hundredth the risk of lung cancer? Are you one thousandth the risk of lung cancer? Which is it? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. It's one thousandth yeah, wow. the risk. So it's, you know, very, so the answer is how, what's your risk of, and also, what, what age did you start living healthfully? So I would say that there are countries around the world, like the Catawba Island studies, where you have islands which never had heart disease, and don't have heart disease in their ancestry. They don't even eat a perfect diet. You know, heart disease just simply doesn't have to happen if you start eating a healthy diet at a young enough point. If you wait till your heart is really damaged and you have a lot of disease present, it's not gonna be a 100% guarantee. But yes, a healthy diet, a really super, truly healthy diet should be totally protective against heart disease in almost everybody except for an incredibly rare person with some genetic defect in apoprotein or a genetic defect in heart function or very, very rare diseases. We're talking about probably less than one in a, may, way less than one in a thousand who started this diet. If you had my children who eating healthy since a young age, you know, and you know, I know I have no risk of heart disease. I'm never gonna have a heart attack or a stroke. I can say that right now. It's not something you worry, have to worry about. And that's the beauty of this because you don't have to live with fear. You know, with regard to cancer risk, it's a little different because your risk is affected by what you ate for the first 50 years of your life. It's even the first 20 years of your life, but the longer you eat healthfully, the more that risk goes down. Just like you quit smoking and younger, and the longer you stay away from cigarettes, the risk goes down. And of course, that's why we're advocating a diet that seems so excellent that seems uh, too hard to achieve for many people because we want to give people a program that really works. And if we gave them a diet that was moderately nutritionally better than what they're eating, it wouldn't reverse the methylation defects. It wouldn't reverse the damage and really dramatically lower the risk of cancer because the damage has already been incurred later in life and it can progress. So we need to give them a diet that's really, truly excellent so we put the power back in your hands so you can control your health destiny and get a really strong decreased risk in these diseases. And I'm convinced that the decreased risk of cancer from eating a really healthy diet, even when it's adapted after the age of 50, will be more than an 80% drop in it's cancer gotta risk. Be. It's got to be, because we it's see that be. even in studies where people just eat green vegetables, you and mushrooms they drop at, seven, if they just you eat have. greens and green tea and mushrooms, they drop at 84%. That's you right. know, so we, and even with people who have cancer, drop the risk of death from in the 60s and 70s, we eat a really healthy diet. So we know we can drop the risk dramatically, probably in, even in people not eating healthily who adopt a healthy eating, we're seeing, we're thinking like 90% or more drop in cancer occurrence risk. So we're talking about dramatic changes in these diseases that afflict Americans. 
Uh, Brenda, do you remember that it was recently, about three years ago, I forget, a study that was done how rapidly it happens. It doesn't take months or years, it, it's weeks. You remember yeah, that study? Absolutely, and I, and I can say with my own work in the Marshall Islands, that was probably the most shocking part for me, is how rapidly the changes happened. And we had people who had had pain in their legs, you know, in intermittent claudication, and that where they couldn't walk across a room, and they had had it for 15, 20 years in some cases, in a week it was gone. Um, the changes can happen very, very rapidly. I w it reminds me of a, of, a, of a diabetic who was in California. He was in um, Kaiser Permanente Insurance Company going to see his podiatrist, and he was going to have his leg amputated. He had to have his foot amputated due to gangrene or an early gangrene due to diabetes. And the person, the man with diabetes, started crying and said, I don't really want to have my leg amputated. Isn't there anything I could do to save my leg? And the doctor threw up his hand and said, I don't know, why don't you see Steve, the Dr. Steve below it. He's into this crazy diet that helps people reverse diabetes. Maybe it'll help you, you know. So of course the guy's leg comes back and he, and he saves his leg. But he wasn't even going to mention the diet, that he could go on a diet and save his leg or even do anything about his diabetes. He was just going to surgery and operate and cut off his leg. He wouldn't have mentioned that until the guy started crying and telling him, isn't there begging the doctor, isn't there anything I could do, anything I could possibly do that may help me? So go to the weirdo downstairs. Yeah, go to the guy downstairs, yeah. the guy downstairs <laughs> right, and say, you know. But, but what we see this all the time. We see people with very serious conditions and very advanced disease processes, pathologies, that still get better and reverse these diseases. So there, it is tremendously hopeful for even people who've eaten poorly and have disease, and it is tremendously protective. And I always make the statement that eating right is a hundred times, at least a hundred times more protective against future heart attacks than taking cholesterol-lowering drugs and, and taking blood pressure no. medications. This, it's not a compar no comparison at all. The, the, the blessing that Anna and I have had, I, I, I assume both of you have had, after everything else fails, people show up at a place like Hippocrates. I mean, they are desperately sick, and we watch them in a matter of three-week period transform. I mean, if you came to a graduation, you would honestly think we had professional actors from Hollywood <laughs> getting up and telling lies every week. Because, you know, like every once in a while, somebody sits in the room and says to us, come on, <laughs> you know, come on. We just had a woman, I was in Boston speaking, and it took 25 minutes before they w could introduce me, because we had person after person stand up and talk about how they healed. And one woman, this is a scary story, she didn't even have cancer, she had pre-cancer, dysplasia. And they said, we have to do a uh, radical mastectomy on both breasts, mm -hmm. we have to immediately put you on chemotherapy, and <coughs> she said, y you know, you can't, you know, I don't want to do that. And somebody, her neighbor said, go to Hippocrates, comes, this is in April she comes to us. I lecture there in October, completely free of this. And I said, what did the doctor say? She went back to the same doctor. He said, I must have made a mistake. She said, well, how about if I listen to you? I wouldn't have any breast. I'd have chemotherapy. You know, it is a bizarre world, just like this guy. They're going to cut his leg off. And here's a guy two seconds away downstairs. If he drilled a hole, he could drop into that place. <laughs> it's a, it, you know. But it's not that we have to make them wrong. I feel bad for them. I actually feel more compassion today, after 48 years of doing this work for doctors and the profession than I've ever had before. I think it's time that we, we love and hug them and say everything's okay and let's work together and let's put patients first. Patients first. Not egos and profits and ideologies and all this nonsense that we waste time on. Good evening. Um, so considering the fact that uh, cancer rates are increasing, according to the World Health Organization, one in two men are going to have cancer and die within their lifespan, and one in three women are going to have cancer and die within their lifespan. And we have heart attacks killing about 3,000 Americans every day. What branch of medicine do you think can accept plant-based nutrition and use it as a primary defense in face of the diseases? And I'm asking as a medical graduate? Well, I hope it starts with general practitioners. They see the most people. Which branch of medicine do you think can accept plant-based nutrition and use it as a primary defense in the face of the 
Oh, cardiology nice. for sure. Cool. Well, yeah. I personally became a, I went to University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and I became a board certified family physician because I wanted to have the access to care for every patient who came to me. Children with type 1 diabetes, I wanted to take care of the elderly. I didn't want to have to turn people away. Women with gynecologic problems, I wanted menopausal issues. I wanted to make sure I could care for all people because nutrition is so effective across the broad spectrum of diseases. If I, and it's so exciting to be able to take care of everybody and with all these problems again and have them reverse themselves. So I'd be an advocate for you following in my footsteps. You know. and, and the other thing to know is that lifestyle medicine is really becoming a specialty and there's now a board certification exam by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. You can get board certified in lifestyle medicine. In Lithuania they have a lifestyle medicine master's program and a three month uh, elective for physicians in lifestyle medicine. And so I think that if, you know, you have that interest, regardless of your specialty, whether you're, you know, an oncologist or a, a cardiologist or an endocrinologist or a family doctor, to get that certification in lifestyle medicine just, it, it's, yeah. it's part of every single specialty of, of medicine. And it's conducted in English, by the way. It costs pennies and it's can go over for the summer. Yeah. Even if you become an internist and get a general, you know, general internal medicine, you could still proceed with getting your specialty in lifestyle medicine on top of that and take care of all adult diseases and you don't want to take care of, you know, so I, don't, I think that's, you know, you take something, as it parallels to being just an oncologist or cardiologist, because now you can have broaden the amount of people you can care for. Okay, last question. I'm just going to ask a quick question. I, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Hi, so six years ago, sorry. Uh, six years ago, I went to the Hippocrates Institute. Uh, I was diagnosed with a cancerous tumor and uh, Thanks to Brian and Anna Maria, uh, it, it's, it was, I was able to get rid of it without surgery, chemo, or radiation. And, uh, but when I returned home, thank you, and I, at six years, I've been living this lifestyle ever since. And, but when I returned home, it was the combination of Dr. Furman and, and what Hippocrates taught me. So I am looking at the presence of my greatest heroes tonight. So. Um, Steve, thank you so much for bringing them together. I mean, these four incredible minds here. Uh, what a gift uh, to have such lifesavers. But my question is that what probably caused my cancer is I was on medicine for ulcerative colitis for almost 20 years. And uh, the fine print on a lot of these medicines is, oh, may cause malignant tumors. And when I've gone back to these gastroenterologists with no symptoms after, you know, 20 something years of saying I'd, had, I'd be on this medicine the rest of my life, they literally don't, they're not at all interested in my story. And it's so significant, I mean, they just say, oh, did you do that holistic thing? I mean, they, they could care less. And, I mean, gastroenterologists, I get it, the cancer, they, they're, they're putting their license at risk if they, you know, fought, you know, start recommending this and people die, but, but gastroenterology, that's digestion. Like, why is nutrition not emphasized as their backbone? I mean... They don't even think dentistry has it. Your mouth has yeah. anything to do with the body. You know, it's, it's <laughs> all, the, every day, all the time, the person comes back, their psoriasis is gone. Their psoriatic is resolved. They go, they come back, see the doctor and the, the rheumatologist is yelling at them and throwing them out of the office. The patient <laughs> comes back to me crying and say, he threw me out of the office and I want to show him how it got better. Yeah. They threw him out. Yeah. You know, it was like they were angry they got better. That's yeah. exactly. I, I, I can't figure, can't, yeah. So when you got well, at Sloan Kettering, the oncologist threw you out of the office? No, he was, he was actually a doctor. A local guy. Yeah. Okay. It or they say to a patient sometimes, oh, are you going to just eat rabbit food the rest of your life? Yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> have to come. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. yeah it's, uh, sometimes they're threatened by this because they're not experts in it. And now their egos are threatened because they had nothing to do with it. They know their little particular information, what they know, and now you didn't get well from what they told you to do. It makes them look bad, and they're just going to just try to, you know, cognitive dissonance. They just want to push it away and not to think about it, so get out of here. But, but when you look at oncology or colitis or Crohn's disease, they have zero success rate in most cancers. I shouldn't say zero. They have about a 7% success rate. That's what the medical journals report to us. So long-term survivals are 7%. 
And when it comes to colitis, every single doctor is going to tell you that it's chronic. You'll have it for the rest of your life. You know how many people I've seen get rid of colitis? It's like shocking. On a raw diet. <laughs> the opposite of what they're telling you. Don't eat raw food. Everything has to be blended. We blend it, but cooked. I mean, it's, it's outrageous. But how we have to change it is not just look at how insane that whole thing is. Is we have to hug them. We have to tell them we understand. We have to tell them we love them. That we know you're failing all of the time. We don't have to say that. We know that there's, <laughs> there's something else that we may offer to this equation. Wouldn't it be nice if you could succeed more than 7% of the time? Or more than none of the time? Wouldn't it be nice? And I think doctors want to do that. I don't think doctors are bad people. I don't think when they were 18 they schemed, oh, we're going to make money and make people angry. I think they really did it for the right reason. I don't know there's too many charlatans that want to go to school 12 years to make a living. They should drop out and go to Wall Street. That's where you make a living. And so along the way they get corrupted, and if they're in the wrong area of medicine, not ER, they do great work, oncology, uh, Orthopedic surgery. These are the big, big failures. They're sort of jokes within the medical community. You know, doctors laugh about these guys because they s fail so often. We've got to embrace them and tell them it's okay. You know, I gave a lecture just a few weeks ago to a 30, ortho 30 oncologists, all oncolo local young oncolo oncologists, and they were working at, and they, and they were very fascinated and interested and asked me very intelligent questions. They were excited about this and they wanted to start a cancer survivorship program at the hospital. And they said to me, here's what we have to offer the patients. We can give them a drug, like a chemotherapeutic agent for most common cancers, and the drug will, will cost about $300,000 a year and will on the average extend their lifespan <laughs> three to six months. That's the average. And they recognized it and they know they have very little in their toolbox. But this is what they've learned and this is what they have to offer people and this is what people want because that's all people can get. And so among themselves, I think those oncologists, those 30 oncologists, all change their diets and they're all eating healthy now and they're all excited about this information. And the regular people, just like everybody else, but they just don't know any better and they, have, they use what they have available to them. And just like everybody, all other humans, they have their insecurities and their egos and everything else. And you know, so what you're saying is true that a lot of doctors are changing and want to learn this information. We have to be embracive to everybody. So there's a whole world out there of people that can support you, especially in, in your endeavor in medicine and be open to, you know, like we're not chiropractors, but we work with chiropractors. We work with so many therapists that are helping us in our work, because, you know, we are so much into the nutrition, psychology, we have amazing psychologists that are working with us, and I can't picture me and Brian sitting doing that everything, so you can't do everything, but you need to have people around you that can support your work and so a doctor can't, of course, cannot be the one that would know everything, but be totally open. But that system has to start from the top. It has to start from the professors that are making the programs at the universities. It has to start from there. And like Brenda said, of course, you're, uh, you're catered by uh, all kinds of pharmaceutical uh, um, um, Representative. re representatives, and you're, you know, you're schmoozed by them, and of course they want you to sell what they have. So it has to change, and I think what happens is that people have to choose by their wallet. So the more that you choose what you want to have, the doctors, the kind of care that you want to have, that's going to change it. And there's nothing else that's going to change it. It's your own wallet. It's your insurance. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stephen. Thank Great you very day. much. I want to thank you all.